1987, the infamous Grim Reaper advertisement warned that AIDS had the potential to kill more Australians than World War II. That didn't happen, thanks to Australia's public health response, which remains widely regarded as one of the best in the world. What's not so well understood is the crucial role that volunteers played at that time. Against a backdrop of fear and homophobia, people volunteered in vast numbers with the aim of saving people's lives and easing the suffering of those who were dying. Their stories are part of a new book called In the Eye of the Storm, Volunteers and Australia's Response to the HIV AIDS Crisis. The Drums' Eliza Harvey has more. In the early 1980s, news of a killer virus in America terrified Australians. We are concerned that AIDS is going to be used as an excuse to reintroduce a whole lot of poof to bashing that has become unfashionable over the last few years. And people like Fred Noel, of course, are in the forefront of that. Despite an almost obsessive interest in the subject by the Australian media over the past 12 months or so, AIDS and AIDS-related diseases remain mysterious and misunderstood in the public mind. It was against this backdrop that young Victorian scientist John Ball attended a public hearing about the virus. The speaker on stage speculated that maybe 10% of the men in that room that night could already be infected and therefore were facing certain death. You could have heard a pin drop. He went on to join a tribe of volunteers. I was willing to step up and fight for my community that was so valuable and so precious to me. I, I wasn't going to lose it. I wasn't going to have it gone after finding something so valuable. Those same qualities that perhaps made me feel like I was not quite the right sort of boy when I was young, quiet, tender, gentle, soft, made me perhaps a very good person to sit by someone's bedside and, and hold their hand at three in the morning as they took their last breath. His story is part of a new book about the volunteers who signed up in their thousands with the aim of saving people's lives and easing the suffering of those who were dying. Volunteering was critical to Australia's response to HIV and AIDS, that it was a contribution that often came at a cost, that the people who played that role really did make significant sacrifices and that Australia is a nation of volunteers. With the big exception of Queensland, Australian governments and the medical world chose to work in partnership with the gay community. The message was that the risk of contracting AIDS could be minimised, regardless of the lifestyle that one led by the adoption of safe sex and drug use practices. AIDS can be stopped and you can help stop it. If you have sex, have just one safe partner or always use condoms. Queensland's gay community felt they were on their own. When AIDS came along, we, we knew that, um, that we had to stand up for ourselves, that the government's approach, the Queensland government's approach would never work, that they just didn't understand how we lived and um, we would all die if it was left to them. We implemented the first study of um, blood from gay men which combined a sort of a history of the the um, the lifestyle of the men. It was it was fairly primitive and done on the smell of an oily rag once again. Um, the Saint, the Anglican St Luke's nurses came and took blood. All that was volunteers. It was really remarkable that many of those people never expect any credit uh, for any of the work that they did. They've they've often not received any recognition for it yet. They really were at the front lines and the work that they did really played such a critical role in a really difficult time in Australian history. Well, adjunct Professor Bill Botell is a strategic health policy consultant from the University of New South Wales. During the worst of the AIDS epidemic in the mid-80s, Bill was the senior advisor to the Federal Health Minister. He joins us now on the panel. Great to see you, Bill. Thank you for Hi. your time. 
Uh, you weren't just professionally involved at that time. It was a very personal journey for you too. You were a young gay man in the 80s when the AIDS epidemic hit. What is your recollection of that time? How did the virus make you feel and those in the gay community? It was a really extraordinary time. And 40 years later, I've got to admit that some of it I blip out. Uh, you had to be there to see your friends, your loved ones becoming ill, dying in very horrible circumstances and no evident way ahead. Uh, we live in a time of COVID where very quickly we found we had a virus. But in 1981, 82, 83, it went on for months and years. Nobody knew what was causing this terrible disease. Mm. And it was only after a great deal of investigation by wonderful scientists and doctors that people understood it was even a virus. Mm. And people were extremely shocked that a virus could cause such havoc. Mm. And it, it was, there was no rule book. Uh, there was a great deal of fear and misinformation coming out, I've got to say, from the United States at that time. And the challenge in front of the Parliament of Australia, the government, the opposition, the uh, medical research communities, but most importantly, the people living with the disease and at the front line, the challenge was to come together as one and to try to figure out the way ahead on care, treatment, research, and above all, prevention. Mm. And we will get on to that policy uh, approach, but for you, you mentioned how traumatic it was for many. You were losing friends and loved ones. You, in yeah. fact, lost your boyfriend at the AA in 1987. Mm. Uh, I guess just how, just how tragic was that for you? Well, it and was... And I can imagine, yeah, very. But that also, you know, you're, a, you're 20, you know. You're meant to be carefree having this wonderful life. Uh, before HIV, uh, it was a great life. Uh, mm. it was gay liberation. Uh, I was in New York a lot, uh, in Sydney, which was a tremendous city uh, in the full flower of uh, changing uh, sexual behaviour and welcoming, accepting gay people. Uh, it was a time of great optimism and hope. And then in 1982-83, that came to a very screeching halt. And many people, uh, unfortunately, did not survive that period. Others did. And uh, it, you know, it, it's a remarkable thing to look back on. I guess it is a bit like my father, who was in the Second World War. And I don't think I, until AIDS came along that I understood really what my father had gone through when he had gone off to North Africa and uh, Asia and so on and fought in the war and lost his friends. Uh, it, it, it was similar to that, I'm sure. Mm. This book that we were speaking about in the lead-in looks at the role of volunteers, which was often where there was, it was the kindness of strangers that was being offered to people in the hardest times of their lives. Um, did you see during that time some of the best of humanity and also some of the worst? Uh, Look, the best of humanity far outweighed the crazy and the unfortunate people who tried to conjure up fear and hysteria about AIDS and to rely on sanction and isolation and quarantine and all of this stuff. Uh, by far, the greater response in Australia was around the people right at the front, the volunteers, the people who are living with the disease, the doctors and the carers, the clinicians who are looking after them, the researchers like Ron Penny and David Cooper, all of those people displayed the most astonishing love and compassion and support. Uh, it was a shock to me, I've got to say. I never thought I would see such a thing. And I know that it was that energy that the government of the day, uh, Dr Blewett, uh, supported by the Liberal opposition of the day and the state and territory governments, that became the driving force in Australia. Mm. Not to punish, not to discriminate, not to rely on stigma and hatred, but on love and compassion. Mm. And we went a long way and we put in very radical, very bold policies at the time that people said, my goodness, could never be implemented. Use of condoms, uh, clean needles and syringes, but bringing the people who were marginalised right into the heart of government policy making. Mm. We consulted them first and we consulted them last and we created a, a wide range of institutions uh, 
that brought together the volunteers, the people with expertise, uh, who are great for the people who had care and treatment. They had to look after people. We had no effective treatment for over a decade. Mm. Uh, but also they were tremendous in applying the knowledge they learnt to the challenge of prevention, to say that we could prevent the disease from getting worse. Mm. And I, I, it sounds obvious now, but at the time it was bitterly resented by the upper echelons of some in the medical profession, some in politics, who said that this couldn't be done, it was impossible. Mm. Well, the volunteers and the people closest to the problem uh, thankfully proved them wrong. Nick, listening to um, Bill's reflections there on the stigma, on the response, you were diagnosed with HIV in 2012, very different time to the 80s. What was that like for you being on your diagnosis and what is it like living with HIV in 2021? Look, in, in 2012, it, we were you know, literally decades away from the, those darkest days of the Australian epidemic in the 80s, that's for sure. Um, but when you are diagnosed as a queer man, as I am, with HIV, it comes along with a lot of uh, internalised stigma, a sense of failure. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't around uh, in the time that Bill was just talking about. I was born in 1982, so, you know, I don't know a life as a queer man, as a queer person, that isn't under some sort of that this cloud of HIV. Um, and as Bill said, it, it mobilised us, it radicalised us, and, and we, we learned to take care of one another. But um, when I also was diagnosed, I felt an extraordinary amount of gratitude uh, to those survivors, to those people who aren't with us anymore, who we lost in the 80s and 90s, because they fought hard to create the systems and the structures and the access to the life-saving treatments that I now have the privilege of taking every single day. Mm. You know, I, I, these days I take one pill every single day that thankfully is subsidised by the government, and that one pill means that I cannot pass HIV on to my partners. I can conceive children without fear of, uh, of my children contracting HIV, and I'm going to live a very long, happy life. You know, I worry more about my bad knees and that I smoked in my 20s <laughs> more so than I do now That's about my good. HIV and okay. what an extraordinary gift that is but mm -hmm. um, not enough people know that because mm -hmm. the power of HIV AIDS and the power of the you know the Grim Reaper and the power of all that stuff means that for a lot of people HIV equals mm -hmm. th mm -hmm. that time. Uh, interestingly uh, could I I mean you've gone into your line of work as an infectious disease specialist because of the HIV epidemic that was experienced in in your birth country can you tell us about your experience? Yeah, but absolutely. So I'm uh, born in Zimbabwe and um, Sub-Saharan Africa and Zimbabwe in particular have been very deeply and devastatingly impacted um, by the HIV pandemic and it continues to have impacts today. Um, so when I was deciding what to do professionally, that certainly played a lot into my aspirations for what could my meaningful contribution do working in medicine and that realisation that I think um, Bill and Nick have reflected really clearly is that a lot of the missteps and the failings were fundamentally about um, stigma, discrimination and how they then combined with structural inequalities to really allow people to um, to, to be sick and not have opportunities for wellness and have opportunities and access um, to healthcare um, supports that would actually help them um, to be well. So very much at the core of um, the reasons why I chose to um, study or specialise in infectious diseases in particular. Mm. Um, and there's been so much learnt as well from that initial response um, in, and how it still informs our approach to things like COVID today. So that really um, deep understanding that unless, you know, the science alone will never be enough, unless you can actually deeply partner with community and understand the emotion, the sentiment and the ramifications at that very personal level, um, it's very difficult to do harm minimisation and prevention. Um, so it's that beautiful balance of understanding the science and using that to inform a process that evolves over time and allows people to move from a, a place of fear, um, you know, and anguish to one of real hope and thrivership, um, which is where I think for the most part we now are um, in settings like Australia where people have access to multiple resources that meet their needs and, and allow them to manage um, their HIV on their own terms. Mm.
Rebecca, I know you've done... Oh, yes, please, Nick, yeah. go on. I was just and, and just to jump into that, it's such a fantastic point. Like the and the history of HIV AIDS is an extraordinary partnership between community and science. Um, you know, I love seeing uh, some of the world's leading HIV scientists and doctors and physicians claim to be activists because they are. They they do stunning work. But the third piece of the puzzle there is the state and. Consistently, we're, we're let down, I think, by the state and by geopolitical issues and by greed. I mean, we've had the tools to end the global AIDS crisis, which I should still point out claims a quarter of a million lives every year mm. um, around the world. We've had the tools to end that since 1996. Mm. The thing that's been stopping us is uh, the, the, the relationship between the state and greed, really, in pharmaceutical it, companies. Is that how you see it, Bill? I mean, you were, you were critical as senior advisor to Dr Blewett as the health minister back in the early 80s. What's the roadblock now, do you see? Well, we have one very serious roadblock in the world at the moment, that's COVID. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the horrible problems that are developing in much of the world in relation to COVID and in the developing world, Zimbabwe, India in particular, are being uh, sidetracked by the tremendous toll that COVID is taking. Now, uh, functioning health systems in much of the world uh, require investment. They require order and certainty. And of course, with COVID, that's terribly disruptive. So I am concerned that people who should be getting the treatments of which Nick rightly talks and that are available and being distributed by such organisations as the Global Fund. Uh, if the health system is disrupted by COVID, then the problems for people with HIV who need those treatments and for prevention services and all sorts of things become astronomically more difficult to, uh, to attack. So uh, as soon as we've got to get rid of COVID, <laughs> we've got to vaccinate the world and then eliminate it. Mm. And we've got to keep uh, plugging away really seriously mm. at uh, continuing to keep on top of HIV, mm. which as Nick said, I, uh, the death toll from HIV in 40 years has been 35 million people mm. have lost their lives. Uh, and uh, COVID hopefully will never become like that because the response is quicker and we've got the vaccines and better treatments and so on. But you know, a lot of people have died and we can't allow ourselves to go backwards in the world in getting on top of HIV. So then if, if we look back to when the, uh, the epidemic hit, uh, Bill, you know, you spoke of how the government approach at the time was quite radical. It was built from the ground up. It listened to scientists, doctors, those living with HIV. And then, and then you came up with the... There was the Grim Reaper ad. Uh, what was the idea, you know, behind something like that? Do you think something like that would work now when, you know, we're living through COVID? Well, uh, for my sins, I own up to being one of the organisers, instigators of the Grim Reaper Act. It's been a bit uh, traduced in the history of this, but in 1987, it became very apparent that we had to convince the Australian people, not just people uh, most likely to uh, get HIV and AIDS, but the Australian people that they had to support and fund for a long time really radical policies, giving clean needles and syringes to injecting drug users, that is a harm minimisation approach, uh, talking about gay sex, uh, the need for uh, sex workers to insist that condoms be used uh, uh, when they dealt with their clients, a whole range of things that, believe me, were extremely difficult to take to the people uh, of Australia at that time. So we had to get the politics out of it, the party politics, which was one thing. But we had to explain that if we didn't rely on behaviour change from the mid-80s onwards, we would run the risk of going in the way that the United States went, where the caseloads were going up uh, every month and in the rest of the world. Mm. So it, it, was, it was bold and, you know, it made a big impact mm, uh, mm. In, a, in, those, in those times. But after that, uh, we saw really rapid uh, declines in the rate of new infections with HIV. And more or less, the policies that were put together uh, in the 1980s in about five years, with the support uh, of the then opposition, when they became government, they, they followed them through under many health ministers from then till now, uh, Graham Richardson and Peter Dutton and... Mm. 
Uh, Greg Hunt, you know, they've all followed on that line and the states and territories have. Mm. Queensland came into line eventually. Mm. And it's been a great achievement. We have made sure that we never had party politics or silly debates uh, get in the way of delivering the services that we needed and uh, the treatments and the prevention services. Mm. And I want to say on volunteers, just to say, if they had not stepped up in their thousands none of what we did would have been possible. But because they did, everything was possible. Mm. Uh, it was from the bottom up. And the federal government really just said, we will do what you say we should do. We will fund it. And the politicians of the day, to their very great credit, just uh, didn't quite get out of the way. They funded everything. Mm. Mm. But they funded it in accordance with the policies generated and laid down by the people who are right at the front and, and most close to the problem. So, Rebecca, there's a clear situation of behaviour change. As oh, a result absolutely. Of and in fact, just listening to Professor Botel, I mean, I was in my early teens when I saw the Grim Reaper ad, and I distinctly remember thinking, this is a community health problem. Mm. And I think it was the first time I've ever heard the word condom. I'm a Catholic girl, no one talked to me about condoms at home. And I think I got my, ge my geography teacher told me about sex at school very badly. <laughs> so one of the things that the Grim Reaper ad did so it made me think, this is a community health problem and we all need to educate ourselves. Mm. It actually it helped me ed educate myself about sex. Mm. And it was extraordinarily effective, even though it's been lampooned and said it's kind of... Um, mm. But it was incredibly effective for my generation. It also shows the power that if you don't stigmatise a, a population you have really clear, opaque health messages. There are no milkshakes mm. in, mm. in, mm. in mm. the Grim Reaper ad. The, milksha the milkshakes you know didn't stick around about. for very long. You know what it's about. You yeah. know what you have to do yeah. to protect yourself, and yeah. it's a community problem. Perhaps it was very fit for the time it because was. of the results that it had. <laughs> Moving on now, um, but I'd like to thank adjunct Professor Bill Botell. Uh, he's a strategic health policy consultant from the University of New South Wales. It's always so good to speak to you. Thank you very much for sharing your professional and very personal story. Thank you.